Hi, we're the Foreign Field Hill Living History Group. We're here all week at the Chalk Valley History Festival and we have asked leading historians and speakers and guests here at this festival, what is the one historical thing that you really wish people would just stop believing? This is Chalk Valley History Rage. For me, it's about how Americanized sort of the D-Day landing and a lot of World War II's become. Now, that's not to say, obviously, they didn't have a huge influence, which they very much did. But my grandfather, he fought in the war, and I, I've, I've been blessed to look at all his diaries and see the, see the reality of the situation and talk to people like James Holland. And you see these amazing sort of films and footage, and you're sitting there thinking, this is incredible. There's so much British influence. I mean, on D-Day alone, 80% of the troops and the machinery that was on those beaches were a British, Canadian and uh, Commonwealth force, essentially. Uh, meanwhile, that's not to say, obviously, on some of those beaches, the Americans had horrific fighting. But Britain has been slightly written out of the story to some degree. Now, Saving Private Ryan is one of those films where we see this amazing 20-minute footage of the American landing. and. It is mind-blowing, and I would still say to this day, it's the best film footage there can be on this. But it has left Britain slightly in the dark in their role and influence on the D-Day landings. And so for me, the myth I think people should look into and really appreciate is the role that every nation had to play on those beaches on those days and throughout the war. And uh, yeah, I think, I think that covers it for me. Right then. The historical fact I wish people would stop believing is that you cannot move in medieval armour in any shape or form, that you end up doing the landed turtle on your back and that is your very painful death that is about to ensue. It's not a myth, it's not a fallacy. We've been wearing armour for about 2,000 years from by this stage. If you couldn't move in it, if you couldn't fight in it, we wouldn't wear it, basically. Um, I will point out from this stage, I am missing some armour, it fell off, but armour is designed to be moved in. On all of my joints I have articulation, for example on my elbow here, I can move that on my shoulder, I can get my arm above my head, it doesn't restrict me. It does stop me moving in my full range, but it doesn't constrict me that much that I can't move, I can't fight. I can run, I can jump. Forward roll. I can cartwheel. I can do anything in it really. I can scale up ladders, you know, I can fight, you know, with a variety of weaponry. And I can keep going. You know, you train in armour, you get used to armour, it becomes a second skin almost. And you just keep going in it. So this mythical fallacy that the moment you put it on you're weighed down it's too heavy it's utter nonsense Go. i wish people would stop believing that the first world war was a complete and utter horror show yes it was awful men did die bad things did happen however especially in britain 89 percent of the soldiers came home yet we constantly focus on those who died and forgetting those who did come home since the end of the war the mythology of it has completely changed compared to where we are today in 2021 if we were going to go back to armistice in 1918 everyone had a completely different perspective of the war to what we do now over the years we have had poets who have come about in the late 1920s early 30s who have re-kind of shaped the memory and mythology of the war for it to being about um, death, loss, that lost generation coming out. And then in the 50s and the 60s, we have Anne and Clark with the lines led by donkeys, which makes it believe that Haig and all the, um, the officers were making sure that everyone was charging into their death so carelessly. This wasn't the case. This was a first industrialised modern war. Everyone was learning as they go. Amy Fox has got a fantastic book called Learning to Fight and she really hones in on the fact that at each element during the war you, you learn from your mistakes and you continue. So it wasn't an awful show, it was just the fact that it was so unprecedented for the time they did not know how to adapt. And then we have the 1980s come along and Blackadder and those iconic scenes in Blackadder that make you think, God, 
yes, Haig's um, cabinet of wine was close, far away from the battlefields as possible, and he was safe and everything going on whilst all the men were up front dying. Or the fact that Blackadder was completely utterly useless and, you know, all these funny comedic traits that have been shown and make us believe that the war is so awful compared to what it was. Now, I'm not really saying at all that war is good and that war was ever nice because it wasn't you know the trench warfare wasn't nice but when you have soldiers who are spending I think it was a maximum of five days in the frontline trench before they were rotated and taken behind the lines really got to think of if your initial thoughts of you know what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of the first world war and it's mud blood donkeys um death poetry and I think it's something else but if you think of those your typical ones then you're probably thinking mythology of the war rather than the actual history of it so my recommendation to challenge this is probably dan todman's fantastic book the great war myth and memory which really hones in on those kind of sections and he really explores as to why we believe this and think this about the war and then he kind of gives the evidence to support it and say actually this wasn't the case at all so the thing that i, I wish people would let go and, and change the way they view it when it with regards to history is ownership Everyone thinks they own history, whether they're a, a classic a academic, PhD, master's degree, whatever, or they're a, an ex-military person, or they're somebody who's the opposite and comes to history, they're a battlefield guide. Particularly with the Great War, everyone thinks they own their, their, their niche in history. Actually, I think history is for all of us. We all have our own view of history, we all have our own aspect of it, and we should all respect each other's views and listen to each other more than we do. There's nothing worse than putting an opinion out and being shot at left, right and centre. And it's not academic rigour, sometimes it's just plain nastiness, jealousy, jealousy or, or, or just people vile. But really, you know, we all have a view, we all have our, we're, we're all stakeholders in history, we're all players in history, so I do wish people would just ease off each other and be a bit more friendly, a bit more interactive, just like they are here at the Chalk Valley History Festival, where everyone's got a common interest, common passion, and shares their knowledge with, without elbowing each other out of the way to, to stake their claim and their ownership of their particular corner of history. And you know, it's almost the same as when you're trying to find a nice stand to do your bit on the Western Front, and people say, no, no, I own this bit, elbowing you out of the way. So let's all just be a bit nicer to each other about it. The myth that really bothers me in history, well there's many myths that bother me in history, but one of them that's a small one but it's a bit of a niggle, is that no Viking helmet has ever been found with horns on it. The Vikings never have horns on their helmets, they've never been depicted with horns on their helmets, and no Viking archaeology has ever been found that suggests they had horns on their helmets. It was made up by Wagner's costume designer in the 19th century. He just thought they looked cool. So, guys, don't wear Viking horned helmets. <laughs>